wettest autumn on record this year. Provisional figures show there was an average total of 348.4 millimetres of rain across the country in September, October and November. An Empshire faster due, the weather nearer to home. Dry but generally cloudy on the Isle of Man this evening and overnight. Lowest temperatures down to 3 degrees Celsius. Sunset was at a minute to 4. Sunrise tomorrow morning at 8.16. Dry tomorrow with patchy cloud and some brightness. Freshening southwesterly wind. Top temperatures up to 9 degrees Celsius. And cloudy on Wednesday with a few outbreaks of rain and a fresh to strong southwest wind. Manx Radio News, four minutes past six. I'll be back with a roundup at 11. In the meantime, keep up to date by following us on social media or head to manxradio.com. Mudhouse Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc at an unbeatable £40 for a case of six. Wine, beer and spirits always for less at ShopRite and WineRite Extra. Where would you go to get your Samsung, Sony or Panasonic TV repaired? Walton's, of course. Visit us at Cool Smithy on the Isle of Man Business Park or call 614 536. Waltons, always there when you need a repair. Why wait when Furniture Land has a huge selection available for immediate delivery? Three piece suites, dining and living room furniture, and check out the first floor selection of amazing beds too. All from Furniture Land, Carpet Land, West Street, Ramsey. Drive an electric vehicle? Need a charge point? Contact EV Man today for a Wi Fi enabled pod point with a three year parts and labour warranty. EV Man are the only approved installer on the island. Contact Kim on 304 or evman.im. MOers have moved to Unit 2, Jerby Industrial Estate, with loads more choice all under one roof. Husqvarna Auto Mowers, battery and petrol chainsaws, hedge trimmers, strimmers, mowers, and all your gardening needs. Call Air Mowers on 898-589. Good evening to you, one and all. What matters most? We asked you that question in a survey carried out earlier this year. We asked you, what are the most important current issues that matter to you and your constituency? Well, you told us health and its treatment first, then care for the elderly, recycling, preservation of heritage. Then you said climate change. So we decided to explore these matters further in a quartet of programmes broadcast live on our Facebook page, I am John Moss, and this morning, uh, this evening, a subject that concerns the health, your primary concern, but of the globe itself. I'm going to explore climate change with Joni Farragher, uh, Manx Labour Party's Green Issues Coordinator and co-founder of the Isle of Man Climate Change Coalition, with Mike Rose, whose expertise lies in recycling, head of the Western Civic Community Site, uh, Graham makepeace Warren of Manx Wildlife Trust. He took part in climate protests at Timwold. And someone who is more likely than all of us to feel the influence, I suppose, in years to come of climate change, Archie Elliott, a student and a part of the Student Climate Network. The term climate change was first used, as far as we know, in 1975 by Wallace Brooker at the Lamont Doherty Earth Laboratory, who asked, climate change, are we on the brink of a pronounced global warming? That's the first time, as far as we know, down in print, that phrase appeared. Well, that was the question I asked over 40 years ago. The next question is, if yes, why? Is it a natural cycle? We do have evidence of extreme conditions over the centuries. Volcanic explosions have altered the globe's climate temporarily by throwing masses of dust into the atmosphere. Around about 535 AD, apparently there was an enormous explosion. 2,000 million Hiroshima-sized bombs, that was the equivalent, and it caused a human civilization from Mongolia to Constantinople to be affected, uh, precipitating, we're told, plague, famine, death, and great migration. Other eruptions, such as Krakatoa, uh, dropped the global temperature and hit crop production, and Mount Pinatabu, as recently as 1991, cooled the, glo the global climate. Uh, so solar activity also influences the weather we experience. Uh, that was then. Now we have 7 billion people on this earth, uh, and for over 100 years, the industrial age, we've put into the atmosphere the narrow band that encircles the earth, the troposphere bordered by the tropospause, pores, a great deal of carbon dioxide every year. Apparently, we put in 30 billion metric tons of the stuff. That's more than four metric tons for each of us. In a recent essay in the BBC Radio 4 series on the Jeremy Vine show, entitled What Makes Us Human, the author Michael Monpergo, his most famous work is War Horse, said, and I quote, When we lived close to nature as we once did, uh, when we felt more connected to the world, 
We knew instinctively that nature needed to be nurtured, respected, known and understood. Uh, but our ingenuity as a species, our ability to use language and think and discover, gave us a supremacy uh, where we imagined we were the gifted species, homo sapiens, God's chosen. It was our world. Hubris grew in us like a cancer, became a madness. Now we no longer took what we needed from this earth. We took what we wanted. Well, the world has been this world, namely a globe, for about 4.5 billion years. Humans have been humans for about 200,000 years. We've had periods where the weather became extreme. My point is that we've had these periods. We, the human race, uh, have come through it. So is this just another hiccup? Uh, is this something we should regard as a, a meteorological analogy? Well, let's go, first of all, to, to Graham and ask him, is this, are we all certain that this is definite change happening to our climate? Um, well, I personally would want to look to the science to answer that question. Um, science we can believe in. We know they check their results. They do it thoroughly. Um, scientists constantly uh, question what they're doing. They have different hypotheses and they want to, to make sure that they prove those hypotheses. So, um, yes, if you look at the science, there are definitely changes to the um, the, the world's climate. So you're quite happy with that, that we need to prepare. We need to take, um, take measures. Absolutely. Yeah, with 100%. Uh, let's go to the uh, uh, representative, uh, Joni Farragher, for the Manx Labour Party. Uh, do you feel the same way? Are you absolutely certain this is happening? Absolutely, and I would echo what Graham said, that we need to look to the science. We trust scientists on every other issue. Uh, for some bizarre reason, when it comes to climate change, we seem to feel that we can somehow question experts in this field. The experts are telling us that we um, have changed the climate to such an extent that we've actually entered a new age the age of humans but but if we had been around when we had the last ice age or something uh, and we'd been the sort of people we are now would we've been running around then saying oh it's climate change this is never going to be the same again is that the possibility i don't think so uh, the the signs of climate change as listed by nasa do include an all-time high of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide in our atmosphere an all-time high in human history so that's what's causing that's what's driving human induced climate change mike rose uh, you're very much involved in recycling uh, yeah I, I think the one of the biggest problems that i see is consumerism we consume more and more just explain and more. that what do you mean by that <clears throat> it's a throwaway society so at one time, when we were children, we probably got something that needed to last us a long time. Nowadays, the kids get something and they throw it away. You get a new one. But do we um, all do that? I've read somewhere that we wear our clothes for an average five <coughs> weeks before we get rid of them. That's uh, right. We, tr we tried to get involved with a 12-month um, a T-shirt challenge last year where you had to keep a piece of clothing for 12 months because people don't keep it that long. That was difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, and it does. It I managed it because I don't throw my stuff away. <laughs> Um, is, is that consciously, or you just don't, you just like the stuff? You I just like the stuff. Yeah, my wife tells me off all the time. Sorry, Johnny. <laughs> I was just going to say that goes back to your quote from Michael Mapugo earlier on that we don't take what we need anymore; we take what we want, um, and that is exactly yeah, what yeah. consumerism is. Obviously, um, is that we're um, not only are we are we overusing and not we're not recycling, we're not mending, we're not repairing, but also we are actually being actively led to believe that people who um, advocate those sort that sort of lifestyle are um, kind of loonies and crazies um, or hippies and that that's a bad thing. Aren't and the you? people who win on that one is corporate the corporations that make the stuff that's well, absolutely. The, I mean advertising with, with young people in particular Archie Elliott do, do you feel tempted to, to actually dive into this consumerism? Oh I, I do like to stay out of the consumerism and all I, I like I rarely would go out and say, oh, I fancy buying some new clothes. I find clothes shopping a bit boring, actually. But the, the problem I find is, well, the adverts tell you, oh, it's only one pound, it's on sale. And they almost lead you into saying, oh, I must have that. So if you walk into a shop, you see something for one pound, you think, oh, that's a bargain. I've got to have that one pound T-shirt because it's one pound. But whether you actually need it or not, it's a totally different matter. And if you just look at that one pound T-shirt, the costs to produce it are minuscule. Mm -hmm. The company obviously is still making profit from producing that one pound T-shirt. And then the cost to the environment is detrimental. I, I suppose the argument is that that is giving employment to people in, in another third world country. Uh, people who make these T-shirts basically earn a living and they would perhaps starve. 
without this employment. Well, I think without you buying your one pound t-shirt, you you the the standard of living they're receiving because they're only making a one pound t-shirt is very low, and I think we need to be moving more to a fair trade and ethical source of clothes. So the the farmers, which maybe grow the cotton, they get a good price for their cotton, and then the workers who actually make them into clothes, they receive a good price. And then yes, the price of the clothing might go up slightly more. But that pays for a better standard of living. It, it's the problem with living in the world that we live in, that mm. we take decisions that immediately reflect on other people in other parts of the world because we intercommunicate all over the world and decisions we take sort of reflect all over the world. That is a problem, isn't it? You can't take a, a single decision as you might have been able to 400 years ago or 500 years ago. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that what Archie was talking about there was really interesting because what we're looking at really is that what we value things on is their monetary value mm. as opposed to their um, value in terms of our world. And that's what we tend to, we seem to have moved away from looking at the value of something in terms of how much it costs our world. Um, we have to move away from, from countries measuring themselves <clears throat> on GDP, on, on their, their ability to grow their monetary value. There's companies now, we've had for a while companies that are, are not for profit. Um, you get companies now that are not for growth, so they feel they're the right size to deliver the service that they do. They don't want to get any bigger. Do these companies have shareholders, though? No, and that's the difference. Yeah, because the shareholders want growth, though. Yes, they, exactly. they want profit. Yeah. So how do you get over that? We don't have shareholders. You move away from that model. You're nodding your head there, Johnny. Yeah, I mean, this is... But is it possible? Is it practical in this modern world? Uh, I mean, business not in, drives not itself usually through shareholders. OK, so this is the system that we've created. So what we need to do is address that system and we need to realign that system in line with our planetary goals, essentially. We do need systemic change. Well, you only have to look at the general election in the UK at the moment to see how much money is controlling that, controlling what we see and controlling our decision making. So no change is going to happen with the current system unless we break it. But that comes presumably from the government, because governments like to see growth in the country. In this island, we're told that we need expansion, we need people coming in so that growth is experienced. Um, you can't just come to a halt, otherwise a country comes to a halt. Well, that's what the government would actually argue, isn't it? Well, you're saying government, but what I'm saying is that there's, there's another level beyond that. The government is effectively being controlled by the money. Um, as I say, if you look at the general election in the UK and the media and who owns that media and the, the, the things that we're told to believe and how untrue a lot of that is, um, it's all being controlled by the money. So it's about breaking that system so that they don't control government. Well, we had uh, Kyoto, obviously. We had Paris Agreement. Mm. We've got a whole lot of people. I don't know how many people. I think 25 to 29,000 is being cited at the moment meeting in Madrid for this COP25 uh, gathering. What do you think that will achieve, Mike? I don't think it'll achieve anything, to be honest. Um, when did the, what did the last one achieve? Well, well the, last, the, the last one USA achieved. Well, we tend to have these well, yeah, yeah, the yeah. climate agreement. But um, they actually achieved like the biggest monumental step in actually starting. That, that Paris right. Agreement set out the 2050 target. It then started the way to be able to then move to a carbon neutral yeah, future. But let's all agree... They, they did in Paris. They, they did agree to that monumental target. Except and the yes, USA. The USA pulled the out. U, the USA agreed then, and they still haven't pulled out. They haven't pulled out until uh, the day after yeah. Trump, if he gets re-elected, then becomes, uh, stays as president. But they haven't yet pulled out. But, but they've made uh, the point yeah. that they do not regard that agreement well, as important enough to actually that, justify them staying in it if it suits their purposes. That's the one president. The thing is that that president then can make the decision for the entire country. There's lots of companies within the US which have decided, no, we're still going to follow the Paris regulations. We're still going to cut our carbon emissions without the government. The government yeah, the can't control. They can't some make, yeah, they some can't of the individual companies. states are doing the same yeah. thing. They're doing their own thing. Um, we all have to do our own thing. Well, what about the island? I mean, we here we are, a small mm. island in the Irish Sea. Um, even if it's painful, should we start doing things which we feel are correct? Yes. Like what? Uh, increase recycling, re reduce consumerism. We need to be able to repair things that we used to repair. Isn't recycling up to the the, um, the people in the streets or the people at their homes? They've got to want to do it. it I mean, how much recycling do we do at the moment? Um, in general a, terms. A total... Uh, the Western Media Society does, does approximately 70% a year. 
uh, from about 3,500 tonnes of waste. You, you've got to have the infrastructure there to do it. You've got to um, have I would say what Mike does at the West Amenity Site is fantastic, mm. and I'm, I'm hoping that you work with other amenity sites to, to show them best practice. He's doing a fantastic job there. But you've only got to look across what is a relatively small island, and there's different recycling schemes in, uh, amongst each of the commissioners, and that makes it complicated for people. Yeah, you've there's got only to curbside in three areas, I think. Maybe yeah. two areas now. I think Malou's going to stop doing those, aren't they? And um, even the amenity sites. Why you, are Malou stopping doing theirs? I think it's the cost. And that, that is the thing, isn't it? The cost. Um, I mean, it presumably is. it's a fairly complicated operation. To it recycle. is complicated, and it also depends on the commodity prices. Um, recently, the cardboard market has dropped to record lows, and it's going to drop again. So that means that the, the recycling cardboard that we ship to the UK actually costs us more money. We, we can't get it for zero. Am I, am I right in saying that if someone thoughtlessly puts something in a recycling container that it shouldn't be in, that it can wreck the, the yes. entire consignment? Contamination is a big issue. So yes. what can you do about that? You, you, don't, you can't uh, go through everything. Education. So what do you do if you get a container full of stuff and it's you think there's something in there or you see something? We spend a lot of time taking things out of containers to put them in the right container and telling people off, which we get people get upset with us about. But we need to tell them off. We need to educate them. When, you when they turn up, do you say, can we go through, just have a look at what you're doing? Yes, because people don't realise that immediate sites aren't entitled to take, we're not licensed to take what, food waste. So people bring a big bag, bin bag in from home, what's in, the, what's in the bag, we open it up, sorry, food waste, you've got to take it away. So food waste can go in its own container at the person's home and become... Yes, in, in, your, in your domestic bin. Yeah, but how, how do, we, do we know how many people actually are bothered to do that? Because on a cold, wet winter's night, a lot of people wouldn't want to go outside and actually find them. They don't, no, they don't, I'm afraid. Um, and we have a lot of arguments with people about it. But people are learning, they are learning. I've been there 10 years and they're getting there. Uh, Archie, do, do your colleagues at school, your school, talk about things like this? I presume not, do they? It's not the sort of thing that's... Well, we, we are encouraged to recycle. And it's always been saying to bring in to recycle. How are you encouraged? But, well, it's almost... It's something we're almost taught. It's always, oh, you have this, recycle. you recycle it. It's almost, that's like plastic bottle. You well, Not necessarily plastic bottle, but like cans or paper. It's natural to then think, oh, we should recycle it. It's something which is brought in. But I think we need more education for obviously other stuff we can do as regards to climate because we aren't, talk about, uh, we aren't taught at school how to be more environmentally friendly. We're only in biology touch on the bare basics of the greenhouse effect. So what would you like to see? So I think I'd like to see um, kind of climate education initiated within almost our P4C. Uh, I, think, oh, I can't remember the name of it. We call it life skills. Right. Um, I think generally it's known as life skills. Yeah. Isn't it? But that should be a natural part as you come through school, you yeah. automatically feel this is what I should be doing with my waste. Yeah, and then I think it's almost, especially if you introduce this climate education, it starts in primary school. But if you get them from a young age into kind of good habits within uh, being more environmentally friendly, it then carries on. And you can't, it's, it's much harder to change bad habits. And I think we, it's, it's, we, we want to see um, education about what climate change is, the impacts of climate change, what we can do about it. And it's not just saying it's all negative, we're all going to, you know, there's going to be mass flooding, mass extinction is making a positive effect. It's saying what we can do to solve the problem. Just north of Delhi, I think there's a mountain of waste, isn't there? Mm. It's about 65 metres high and is now a ha an aircraft hazard or something. You f sometimes feel if people were taking a look at that, it would, uh, they would understand what a, bigger, what a big problem is. I think is. Greece has got a big issue with waste as well, haven't they? Mm. Yeah. There's a, there's a danger that you take uh, something like recycling and you use that as an excuse to be able to carry on consuming. It really goes back mm. to what Mike was saying before, that... Um, refusing the item is best so it goes refuse reuse recycle um, recycle is really a last resort um, what we would prefer and you know vegware cups the uh, recyclable uh, bottles that um, people do uh, bring the their own bags reuse. in these days don't they Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, that's they're supposed that's... to, but the reusable bags are actually, they're, they're now uh, using more plastic uh, because people are still just paying and buying more plastic bags. We all have to have a, a change our mindset about how we shop, taking a reusable. Even, I the, always take even the Hessian bags have got a plastic liner. <laughs> well, yes, and, and, and cotton bags have a, a much larger carbon footprint than a plastic carrier bag. Um, you have to use them maybe 300 times before they cover off their carbon There's footprint. a lot of areas we have to reinvent. Can I just go on to turbines? <laughs> um, Etc. We do. We can look out of our window now and see turbines on the horizon. Um, as far as wind power is concerned, 
How valuable is it? Because I've read a statistic uh, that was put about Matt Ridley. I was reading an article by him. He's saying it's less than 1% is actually going down to wind power at the moment. It, so how valuable is it? It's valuable, but how do we make the wind turbines? What materials do we make them out of? Well, so um, Mongolia, there's some sort how, of metal you get from Mongolia where they dig it out, and it's part of the magnets. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, how do we recycle them? How do you maintain them? Um, you need a constant wind. So, because you get intermittents, don't you? Where if the wind drops, I mean, if you had the whole of the UK relying on wind power and the wind dropped, well, we no we use we in. use a small turbine at the site to teach the children about this alternative energy. Site, yeah, yeah, because um, we've got the education trailer now, so we have solar panels and we have a, a, a small wind turbine. At Kurt Michael School the other week, it wasn't windy enough for it to turn, and that starts at ten meters a second. So. But it is useful. I mean, shouldn't houses be built automatically with a small mm. wind turbine and perhaps with solar panels? Um, solar panels, yeah, I agree. Solar panels. Wind turbines, I'm not sure. From it's a wildlife point of view, you really need to look at the impact. Uh, wind turbines can be quite damaging to birds, for example. <clears throat> um, whereas, as you say, solar panels would be perfectly safe. I think the more important thing in terms of house building will be making it more efficient so that it's got a lower carbon footprint in the first place, less heat loss, that sort of thing. And can we do away more with th more things? More thermal dynamic and, and yeah. uh, water collection, water reuse, uh, what they call grey water reuse tanks. Um, they're available now. You can buy them off the shelf. We, we obviously um, are looking to get energy from various places, but do we use too much energy? Should we be, you know, if you get cold at home, put on an extra jumper? Or don't use a spin dryer. We used to do as children, do we? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but these are what, we, what Graham... we presume is as normal life these days, isn't it? That's largely as well what goes back to what Graham was saying about reducing our carbon f footprint by insulating our homes as well and mm. making sure that our um, living spaces and working spaces are actually energy efficient in the first instance rather than having them just leak out heat. Uh, so if we, we go back to that as a basic, insulating our homes, insulating our workplaces and our public buildings so that we don't have to heat them But is much. insulation healthy? Um, shouldn't you have a good draft for your house and it keeps you healthy otherwise? You, you, need, air you need air flow. You need air flow. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise it's still you get moving to passive house. So but, but still you, have, yeah, passive house, yeah. that's one of the principles is air flow anyway, so it's built into it even though it's it's well insulated and, and mm. highly energy efficient. Are these things we're going to have to step back from if we're going to start cutting back on things and saving energy? Well, our, our grandparents, great-grandparents didn't have central heating and no, but they unfortunately did use coal fires. So we, we have we have come back to more of an it's, era. It's so you have like air source heat pumps. They go on the side of your home. They're quite small, small as such. And then you, if you have a good, they have a low flow rate. So they're not maybe the best if you have very poor insulation. But if you insulate your home well enough, that then will heat your home, and then it, it's it's free free heat. Can I just move on because we're coming mm. to the end of the program already? Yes. Um, I just mentioned that Culture Vannon. Um, have got a, a production called Man's Green Footsteps. Uh, Sarah Mercer, the graduate from Durham, has uh, brought out this project, a series of projects working in collaboration with communities around the Isle of Man, culminating in a mini festival and premiere of the short film in August. The film will follow the environmental journey of the Isle of Man over the next year. G Graham, if I could just go to you, as far as creatures are concerned, animals are basically going heading to the warmer waters aren't they we're getting animals changing their location etc uh, yeah absolutely isn't um, that just nature working itself Do, should we be concerned about that well nature will always look for a balance but um whereas uh, you say obviously you know sea creatures may well be able to move to warmer waters that, that's okay for them if you were a ptarmigan in northern scotland and you need cold climates you've got nowhere to go so you're just going to die out as a result of climate change and it's not just changes in temperature that you have to worry about sea temperatures rising means the sea becomes more acidic um, and we know that's going to cause issue we've already seen bleaching of corals uh, it's going to cause a lot of issues for a lot of other species as well but i don't want to give the impression that i'm talking about climate change because we need to do it to save wildlife i think mark cocker the author makes a really good point that uh, we don't need to give nature a home nature is our home and we need to do it to save the whole of biodiversity to save our own ecosystem the very thing that's keeping us as a species alive just quickly everyone can we find an answer to this as, as an island and as a world do you think are you optimistic if we all work together we still have we still have time to solve this but not very the much time, time is time. running, out. running out as they said yeah. at the cop gathering today we need to get on it now yeah. time is very much gathering out 
Well, time has come to the end for us as well, unfortunately. Thank you very much to the people uh, who have gathered here in the studio. Climate change, one of the things that matter most to you. My thanks indeed to Joni Farragher, to Mike Rose, to Graham Makepeace Warren, and to Archie Elliott, my guests in the studio. Programme available as a video on Facebook, YouTube, and as a podcast on manxradio.com. Next week, care for the elderly. Take care of yourselves, won't you? I'm John Moss. May I wish you a very chill, but... Uh, A very good evening. Get ready for Christmas at Riley's. There's everything.